Well, good evening, everyone. And this is a really special edition of not speaking of seeing, just a dialogue on dance. Um, because I've got my old friend or nemesis Bill with me. Uh, but we also have Cisco. Hello, Cisco. Hi. Hi. Just for everybody watching, could you give us a really brief overview of who you are and why you're here? My name is Francisco Cisco Graciano. I am a dance artist. I have been uh, dancing since I was nine. I danced with a major company for uh, most of my career uh, and um, did my eventually did my MFA. And now I am uh, an incoming tenure track professor at a university in Texas where I teach uh, technique, composition, um, and uh, dance and technology. And uh, right now working in New York uh, for the summer. So I'm usually here at the summer, during the summer. And I'm also a gyrotonic instructor. I, don't, I always, always, always have to put that out because- I was gonna ask you about important. that coming up, but um, Bill, how okay. do you know Cisco? Uh, I know Cisco because I became friends with almost every member of the Paul Taylor Dance Company when he was dancing for them. Uh, and so uh, he originally, I met him the night that the next, the first slide was actually taken. I think it was the first night I met you, Cisco. Mm -hmm. uh, when he came over and was one of my motion subjects. Um, so that was in 2010. That was 12 years ago. That's right. Um, nice to meet you, Bill. Nice now, to meet you too, Cisco. Now here's my, here's my entire body exposed. Yeah, I was just wondering, <laughs> you know, in terms of a, an image that could be made um, about a fellow human, how do you go from just meeting someone to, to making this kind of photograph of them? For me, um, I find it very easy, but I will tell you that I find it very easy because all of the dancers I worked with in my entire life have been very easy because they're comfortable with their bodies. They know how to move through space. They're there to perform. Um, so uh, it ends up being a, usually uh, all of the people I work with in this capacity soon become very fast friends with me, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was true of Cisco and I. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, you have to feel out the situation and see how the person how comfortable they are to do whatever it is you want to do. Hmm. But, you know, it was, it was late at night. He came over, it was dark. It was, you know, we, uh, but he's just like, oh, I'll just put on my dance belt and let's do this. So we had fun. Because uh, Cisco, I don't know if you know this, but the reason why I know Bill is because I used this series of work many times over with my, my students at school. Um, as a point of reference, usually for their A level, which is at the highest school level you can study to in the UK or in England. Um, and certainly this photograph and also a photograph of Aaron Bug was uh, really inspirational for a student of mine who also went on to do a, a public speaking competition about visual art and culture, about dance, uh, funnily enough, and used this image uh, as one of the center wow. So it's Very funny cool. that we're, the three of us are now here together after all this time, actually, um, talking together about, about dance, um, which for me is a real um, treat, actually, because I don't really talk about dance that often with many people, but it is a, a passion of mine, a love of mine um, as an audience member, but also because I think uh, <laughs> my inner dancer was thwarted when I was a bit younger. And mm. I really regretted that. So it's it's always um, a bittersweet thing, actually, to meet and speak with dancers or people who prefer- The thwarting, the thwarting of the inner dancer. I'm, it's it's still in there. It means it, it, it can come out. It can still come out. You can dance in your living room. Martha oh, Graham used to say, if you can walk, you can dance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Bill, you photographed Cisco dancing. Cisco- yes. You are no stranger to photographing dancers as much as being a dancer yourself. You've got a really um, extensive and beautiful portfolio, actually, on your Thank own. Thank you. Website. Thank you. Um, but I do want to talk about this person because he's been hugely important to you in your career. Do you want to tell us a little bit about him? Sure. This is Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor was one of the icons of the American modern dance canon. 
and he was a, a member of the Martha Graham Dance Company. Martha Graham is commonly known in, in uh, the modern dance world as uh, the mother of modern dance. And Paul was one of uh, her dancers for many years until he wanted, until he decided he was going to start his own work, uh, create his own work and start his own company. And in 1954, he did so um, and uh, really broke out on the scene um, um, pretty quickly. Uh, his work, his, his work, the man's, you know, the company is still around. Um, he died in 2018. Um, at the age of 88, and he had 146 works to his name by that point. And um, the the company uh, the the company is, is still around. It's, um, it's celebrating its 70th year very soon, um, 2024, and um, thriving. Um, but but Paul was Paul was a swimmer, um, and he was a painter. And in fact, he went to Syracuse University on a swimming scholarship and he took a dance class and decided this is what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. And so he uh, moved to New York, studied at Juilliard and, and uh, the rest is uh, modern dance history, uh, I assume, I, I guess. But, but the, the swimming and the painting is really important uh, to mention because if you look at his work, um, the use of the back and the way the arms are connected to the back um, is really prevalent in his work. Um, and as a painter, he saw the proscenium as a can as his canvas. So where you weren't just painting uh, just on the lower half of, of the proscenium, it was also up to the dancers to project and find ways to um, paint, if you will, in the upper half of the proscenium. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and uh, I got to dance with his company for uh, 13 years. Two of those years were with the second company, um, only six dancers, and um, and that was great. Yeah, it was a dream come true. It was, when, you, it was when you took this photograph of him, I mean, it seems very kind of uh, candid or, you know, he doesn't seem aware, actually, that he is being photographed. Was he quite a... Um, was he a showy person or was he quite understated? What was he like? He was very quiet. He was very, very private. He liked his, he liked his personal space. Um, but uh, he was, he was very passionate and loyal to his dancers. Um, he didn't say a lot about his work. He wouldn't give us a lot of information about, um, you know, what was going on. He, gave, he directed us very clearly but he never sat us down and said the pieces about this. Uh, it was very, extremely rare for him, for him to ever do that. Is that because he wanted you to find your own way through his direction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the value that I came out of, the, the, val the value of that um, comes through as now I'm a choreographer also. Um, so finding ways to give very clear direction to the people I'm working with without giving them explicit details about what this is, quote, about or what we're trying to project um, was, uh, anyway, that, that direction was extremely valuable to me. So, um, and, and I, 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 I think he wanted his dancers to individualize his work and, uh, you know, the company was around, is, sorry, has been around since 1954. Um, a lot of these dances has been, have been done over and over and over through different casts, um, diff different generations of casts. So you get different bodies coming into the space and interpreting things differently. But the thread of the work, the through line is still, is still there. The essence of, the, uh, of what he made is still there, which is part of the genius that just kind of blows my mind. I'm really interested in that um, that particular kind of relationship, though, between choreographer and dancer, and how you know sometimes we we might encounter like a almost like a celebrity choreographer, and we're going to talk about a couple of them actually, really people who've reached what I'd think of as like a more public consciousness for something that's actually relatively niche, unfortunately, is is dance, isn't it? So um, to know a choreographer's name in in the mainstream is is quite unusual, but 
sometimes you find that a choreographer fades away because the the personality or the celebrity of the dancer takes over. I'm thinking about like big names from the past and and kind of like Nureyev or Fontaine or Martha Graham. These people have kind of um, taken taken over a space in a way that that is perhaps quite unprecedented. Paul Taylor doesn't seem to have been like that at all, but the relationship really between the choreographer and the dancer, what am I trying to get at? Does a choreographer have to be a dancer? It's a really good question. Uh, um, yes and no. I mean, I think, I, I think that your, I think your dancers will respect you a lot more in terms of um, what you can do. You don't need to know you don't need to know a particular set of terminology to um, to instruct or to create a work because there's there's a number of different ways that people, the choreographers work. But um, I think knowing the potentials uh, that the body can can do um, comes from having uh, a dance career. A dance career meaning you've studied for a, an X number of years where you can you know, where you understand how to manipulate movement and energy and time with bodies on space. Um, but, can, we, can we just go into that yeah. a little bit though, because you're talking yeah. about now something that's very physical, where sometimes I observe um, that dance is not purely physical. Of course it's not. So a choreographer is marrying up a physical nature with a kind of spiritual, emotional, psychological matrix. Can a choreographer get by without modeling the physical nature of dance, but instead somehow communing or conveying a sense of the, the spiritual or psychological essence, emotional essence of what it is, what the thing is? So I just wanna make sure I'm getting, are you asking, if the choreographer needs to physically demonstrate the work? Not just that. I mean, okay. we answer that part first. Does it yeah. help that the choreographer models physically what is to become the dance? Depends on the choreographer. I think um, I think a lot of chore most choreographers, uh, that, well, all the choreographers that I've worked with do uh, demonstrate movement and ask you to replicate and then interpret in your own way. Some of them will ask you to interpret in your own way. Some of them will will nitpick until it feels exactly like what they're what they're work what they're getting at. Um, but I you know I, I don't I don't know I'm sure there are some choreographers who go into it with this sort of spiritual mystical approach. Uh, I don't think it's mystical. I don't, I want to just like tone that down a little bit because I can see that that's a mean yeah. finish what is uh, what is there actually, and I don't want that to happen. I, I just want to reference actually Pina Bauch, yeah, who most eloquently said um, something like, "I care less about how my dancers. No, uh, what it, I'm not concerned with the way my dancers move, but what moves my dancers." Yeah, yeah. It's about the human experience. It's, I, I hate that phrase, but it is, it, it's really about what the dancers bring to, you know, and, and this is gonna get into um, some almost somatic work, but, but um, you know, your bodies hold a story and certain parts of your body hold uh, different stories more con, uh, constant in a concentrated way. So um, the, every body, um, is going to demonstrate and physicalize movements in a different way, even if it's the same exact step. There's a there's a different approach to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a different um, resolve. There's a different uh, 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 entry to a step or a move. <clears throat> so um, that and for me, that's the beauty of dance is that it's it's you know it's corporeal based. So it's, it's based in what's going on. If you really break it down, you wanna get really heady. We perform based on where we are 
physically and psychologically, right? So like, if I'm heartbroken or I'm anxious, there might be more, I might not feel as open one, one day, for instance, um, just trying to make things up. Um, or, you know, alignment. Like if you just think about alignment, the word alignment, um, physically, it's this sort of stacking and this like uh, ideal place of where you want to be. But alignment means more. It means, you know, how you are centered. And mm -hmm. sometimes your alignment's off and then that kind of switch, that kind of shifts things in your body too. So, um, the, yeah, the, there, there's so much to talk about. In, okay, in hold part. on a second. Can, can I interject for a second? I've, I'm, Get I'm in there, Bill. I haven't this, heard your voice. Well, because it feels it. like, it feels like Sandy is basically asking you if Sandy's the, the choreographer, say, and she has a uh -huh. sense or a feeling or emotion or an idea in her head. And she would say, I would move this way to describe that idea in choreography. But if mm -hmm. instead of showing that movement, you could mind meld with Sandy and feel what she's feeling and you made what you think was the representation of that idea, would that be her choreography anymore? Or does it have to be in the physical, like you mimicking me for it to be mine? Does that make sense? Like, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like at a certain point, yeah. You could say it's kind of like jazz and you could say, okay, well, I'm sad and I'm going to play this eight bars like this, but you're sad and you're going to play a completely different eight bars. That's a different thing than choreography to me. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's not like, it's not like mm -hmm. the, the first person wrote that eight bars that the second person played. The second person wrote that eight bars and they're the choreographer in that case. Yeah. Well, if Sandy said, uh, I, I want you to move. I am right here, uh, by the to... way. You know, you can check with me what I said. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, I did that, like... <laughs> is, is that is that accurate? Is that like, an act, is he is he well, right about that, Sandy? Well, I really appreciate that because you set me up to kind of ask something that I really do want to ask, but that wasn't. <laughs> <Get in there>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let's just go with what you, you've now Said that. I, just, that? I, I just I just wanted to have some clarity to what you're actually saying. Go ahead. Well, I actually I do want to ask Cisco about a sense of communality, a communion uh, between a dancer and a choreographer. That there's a blur and a blend. There's a projection of something. I mean, Bill's just described it. You know, here I am. I'm the choreographer, and I'm I'm not going to tell you the specifics like you said with Paul Taylor. He didn't maybe go into the detail of um, almost like the, the narrative context of what was going on. But I want to communicate with you, my dancer, um, that you're like a proxy for my, for what I mean to manifest in the physical realm, in the physical sphere. And I, I just wonder about experiences that you may have had where you have been able to really cross that threshold with another human or other humans through movement. I want to know about well, it's kind of yeah, I mean it's 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 a little it's a little difficult of a question to answer because I can't fully express how you feel. Do you know what I mean? Like if if you say uh show me what it felt like this morning for me to see the plant in the window or, or I don't know, I'm making it like that, that, that ah feeling that I just had in that moment, but go <laughs> and I do something. Um, what if that's not the, what if that doesn't resonate for you? Yeah. I, I just, I feel like there, there, are, there are ideas in here and then there are movement. And I think sometimes it feels like they're in alignment, but, they don't have to be, maybe. I don't know. I just it's it's an interesting. It's interesting because you said that that Paul wouldn't tell you what the dances were about, but he'd explain the dances and he'd tell you how to move. And then mm -hmm. you know you made us watch the video of Bessie Schoenberg where, where she's basically saying when you're watching dance, turn your brain off and just let it flow <laughs> past you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, is anybody actually saying what they mean or is everyone supposed to turn off their brains and it's a very emotional viewing dance and do making dance feels more about emotion than thought the way that I think everything is about emotion. 
I think a lot, I mean, yeah. mo- a lot of things are about emotion. We're kind of veering yeah. off this a little bit, but I, I mean, picking up on what Bill's saying, the element of participation for an audience, for example, watching dance, um, the audience aren't necessarily out their seats and moving, mm-hmm. but the, the, the kind of creation of the consciousness in that space with that dance I mean, that's that's another thing. We, I mean, we could really talk about this over like many, many episodes because there seems to be something to really hone in on in that relationship between dancer and choreographer. But there's also then the relationship between uh, the, the dance and the dancer. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful um, piece replicated many times as we know by different companies or by different dancers each of those events bringing their own flavor or energy dynamic whatever you want to call it excuse me and then whatever is there how what is being really communicated and that is dance actually for an audience is it visual you know, we're looking at the dance, right? But are we participating in the dance somehow as an audience? I'm going to make a a bold statement and say yes. Because there's this gets into like psychology a little bit also, but this kinesthetic response to um, when you see a body on stage in a certain position or moving in a certain way, uh, my experience is that there's a kinesthetic response with pain. There's a kinesthetic response with be- feeling gnarled. There's a kinesthetic response with just absolutely loving life and every and everything you do. And there are there are gestures and ways to um, to to show that and to feel that in your body as dancers and as a dancer um, as a performer. Um, often I find myself in these positions of. I want to express, I don't know, anxiety. I want to express the, 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 there's a joy to be had in every scenario. Um, so how can I do that? And can I get you to kinesthetically respond to that and share in that feeling? When it, what about movement with no intention? What about movement with no intention? Yeah. Um, so I don't Cisco know has very strong feelings about so this. We discussed it last week, actually. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't have a lot to say about that. Only because most of, um, even if I, hang on, I have to answer this question <laughs> a little more comprehensively. I, the way I create, is uh, the way I create a finished work is intention, usually intention based. However, if I'm in the infancy stages of creating a work, um, the movement can be completely inconsequential. So it can be something as simple as, um, you know, replicate the shape in front of you with your body. As vague as that. So my phone, the texture of my phone, maybe I'm going to move this way. And then my phone moves into my water bottle and I pull the water bottle towards me. All those things can be completely unrelated. And then you create a little phrase based on these devices, these responses to your outside world. Um, You have a little phrase and now what is it giving me? Where's the intention? What what can I leave out? What can I put in? What can I extend? What can I shorten? What can I change? What can I invert? All those questions come up. Um, It's just a device. But- It seems very derivative though. I'm I'm just, I'm I'm, I'm really grappling with this. You're a Mm -hmm. professional dancer. What the hell do I know? I'm just trying to unpick um, <laughs> the potentials of, of dance yeah. in that I would find it quite uh, maybe actually quite depressing to think that dance is only illustrative. And there seems to be a connection between something that is illustrative and something with intention in that you intend to make a dance about in the same way that uh, I go out on a limb here and say like in visual art, things that are illustrative to me are usually less interesting than things that take 
the art at source almost like this font of some I don't know wisdom or innate power or all the stuff that makes Bill roll his eyes at me um <laughs> wait I'm I'm curious um, can you just I'm not sure I know what you mean by illustrative I'm not following you okay so I want to make a, a dance that comes from a movement that was derived from the texture of my cat or my dog or whatever, the fur. Fun, I love right. it, yeah, yeah. And so I can hope to make my body move in a way that somehow encapsulates that, actually embodies it for somebody else to engage with through seeing. Yes. Okay. So in that sense, it's illustrative. Okay, right. But what, but but. I, what, I was, what I was saying is that those things, the, the, the external world is, it's just a device. I'm not creating this movement because I want you to understand the texture of this onion sitting in front of me. I'm, I'm using it as a way to get to something else. Does, does that make sense? Also, what, are you, what are you getting to though? I don't know. I have right. no idea. That's the joy of it. Who freaking knows? Fine. Okay. But That's... it's a device. It's get, get under it and figure it out. What? Okay. Now, why did I decide to move in that direction in that way? What is this telling? What does this remind me of? I go back to this like simple exercise of like, it all starts like really easy. And you go into the center of a room and you stand like this or with your arms out. And everybody says something. Everybody talks about, what am I seeing? What am I seeing? And then you go out into the center of the room and you stand like this with your palms down. Completely, two completely different things, right? You're seeing two different things above here than if I just flip my hands. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it starts with like the, the, what we recognize in uh, either um, imagery that's sort of historical or um, how we respond to things um, or just usually often uh, culturally, cultural images, um, what those things mean. Um, once you understand how those things uh, speak to you personally, then you can start to build a movement language for that one particular phrase or work, um, so, is so my experience. Dance is then a symbolic language, yes? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Right. I think so. This is what I mean I by source though. The source of anything kind of doesn't have a language. Mm. It just is, right? Yeah, but I, th I think we're limited by the fact that humans and movement are in a physical world, in a body that can only do certain things, that has to deal with gravity. That You know what I'm saying? Like, I think in some ways dance is unique in the, in, in the sense that there are inherent physical limitations to the translation of idea to movement because human bodies can only move certain ways and are, you know, so I think maybe, I think that you're, you're right in some way that it's symbolic, Sandy, but I wonder if that's not necessarily a bug, but rather a feature because it keeps it, it grounds it in reality in a way that ideas are not. Of course, uh, you know, it's a mode, isn't it? It's a, fo it's yeah. a form. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking about someone like uh, Feldenkrais, for example, said that our self-image is tiny compared to our potential. Yeah. Right. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. So, but the reality of motion of your body is also limited compared to the potential of what your mind can imagine. In the same way, right? Yeah, well, I mean, and that's that's what makes the craft so interesting. And that's what you know, it, it, there's 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 still a bajillion things you can do there's a there's a number of different ways you can move um but you know providing that limitation is there's also so many there's just so many things you can do with the body so many ways you can move you can play with tempo you can play with um duration tension there's think about all the ways you just live your life uh every day waking up there's a slog you can add that quality to your one section of a dance or just a, a specific movement. All this stuff is like in the body. We just decide where to put it and where to place it. 
Sandy, do you imagine, do you have ideas of particular works or choreographers that you think transcend that limitation? Um, well, I mean, I do love Pina Bausch. Um, her work to me is really, I didn't know anything about Pina Bausch until I saw the Lynn Wenders documentary, like mm. a lot of people. But I, um, yeah, there's something about, um, again, this idea of being like a source. And yes, there's like narrative qualities and there's lots, loads of um, symbolism in her work. Of course there is. But there's also like this sense that um, there's this capacity for love or hate or these big things that are, we think we know, but are like they transcend an individual. It's not an individual experience. It's, it's part of a, 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 a whole consciousness of, of humanity. Again, Bill, are you rolling your eyes at me? <laughs> no, I'm thinking about, I'm just, I'm trying, no, I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm thinking about, I think that all art, including dance, is ultimately a subset of the source that you're talking about. But I, I do wonder, and, you know, I don't want to, if there's like a side, I don't want to let our side down, which is like visual art is like the the the, the font of true wisdom or something. But actually to me, dance is maybe the closest that a, f a physical being can ever be to, to that source and communion. I think probably because there's such a strong- I think so. <laughs> That's just me. Well, yes, of course you would say that, Cisco. Of course I would say that, yeah, of course. <laughs> there's a, an element of, um, you know, to do with not just movement, but also touch and, um, well, communion. I do wonder about it with song, just the human voice. Mm -hmm. um, there's something ancient, archetypal, you know, that's not just about our lizard brain. It's something else is going on there. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to articulate. Some sort of yeah, shared I mean, history I that gets passed down kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I think it's I think it's hard to articulate, and that's the beauty of the craft for me, is that you can't really articulate it. You can try, and we all do, <clears throat> but the articulation is in the body. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 going back to this idea of like what it, the language <clears throat> with the body, the movement that movement is a language. Um, it's also everyone has their own language that. That is that they're fluent in, but no one else is fluent in, in a sense. And trying to find ways of I'm thinking out loud here, but trying to find ways of, of um, helping other people understand your own language. So, in in order to communicate something and feel that sense of communion, is um, is where the practice is for some of us. That seems quite um, at odds, though. Maybe it's because I don't understand. To me, it seems... And maybe I'm not explaining it well either. But <laughs> to me, it seems that if uh, one, one feels that one has one's own language that's entirely one's own, that that's actually driven by ego, and that actually to transcend that uh, into something that's truly communal, uh, that is about both being part of a consciousness, but also an enabling a stepping out of consciousness through movement, for example. I don't think the ego likes that because it makes what we are and what we do universal. I, I don't know that that necessarily means it's, it's like, you know, the way you are, the, the timbre of your voice is, 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 how you are and how you speak, but not necessarily a chosen element of your ego, right? Like, you know what I mean? Right, if there's some right. wholeness yeah. of humanity and we're all subsets of that, we're all different subsets. I don't think there's necessarily anything separating from the yeah. source as, you, as you're as you trying to say, I don't I, know, maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I think that that's that sounds good. Sounds more clear to me. Uh, I had a teach. I had a teacher I used to study with here in New York. Her name was Christine Wright. I'm mentioning her because she's a legend. Uh, she um, 
she used to talk about the tone of your body, meaning like the, the sound. Everyone has a tone, listen to the tone. What is the tone in the moment? And um, I feel like there's a sense of that that can be translated into movement. I mean, and that's what she was trying to get us all to understand is that um, I'm my sensitivities to movement and how I wanna move and where I wanna draw things out and speed things up are gonna be different than yours or Bill's. So I, I also that wonder- to me is the beginning of your language, your style. Can I also ask what, you know, you're up on stage or Trust is up on stage or Buggy's up on stage and I'm watching you guys dance. The things that you can do with your bodies are not things that I can do with my body necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that you do with your bodies are not things that Paul could do with his body at 85. <laughs> Does, can, can the viewer, the, the, the somatic sensation that you, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the sensation that you have while moving as a dancer on stage, the audience probably will never feel what you're feeling when you're actually moving because a lot of them can't move their bodies the way a professional dancer can. Is, is there something in that? Is there, is there a feeling that you have while doing a certain movement that, 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 that is different than watching somebody do that movement? And, and is, it, is it just a heightened version of the same thing or is it a completely different language? In your brain a different sensation does that make sense kind of i i, I hmm. like i just wonder like you know somebody who goes in olympic swimmer who you know can swim five miles an hour or whatever it is it's like yeah. i will never feel what it what it's like to cut through the water like that or what have you and you guys mm -hmm. are up on stage and you you know there's that one dance the taylor dance where you're up on somebody's shoulders in a hunched position for like five mm -hmm. minutes at the beginning of the dance and then you just the hop down and start moving. If I was in a crunch position for five minutes and tried to stand up, I yeah. wouldn't be able to do well, that. Well, that's right? training. That's 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 training. That's yeah, years, yeah, yeah. But, but training but like, and all that stuff. You know, but you're just sitting there, and you you know, you have a certain feel in your body, and you get down, and you start moving, and there's there's you know, there's a feeling you get when you move your body that I think is different than what it's like to watch somebody move their body in that direction. But so often mm -hmm. in dance you know, you can read a play or you could watch somebody perform a play, but no one's reading choreography and like acting out the dance at home when they get home most of the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, although you do, Sandy does. <laughs> Sandy does. <laughs> Sandy, do you really do that? I have done, yeah. I just, um, yeah. yeah. Because, because you're trying to get what, what the feeling of what it's like for them to do it, or you just, or was it something about the movement that you attached to? That's what I. That's what I'm trying to get at. The the, the movement is like a magnet. Okay. The movement is a magnet. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Wait, say that. Say talk more more about that. The movement is a magnet. Well, I mean, it's not, this isn't just dance exclusive. Actually, it's with lots of things. So it can be to do with the sound of something, and I'll try and repeat it. And Bill, what you're saying about, you know, is a sense of wanting to feel what that other person was feeling. No, it's yeah. not. It's that I want to feel. I, that's very subtle, isn't it? it, it yeah. I know it's being modeled for me, but it's not covetous in any way. It's not possessive. Right. But right. it's a magnet. So it draws me to it. And um mm. Sometimes I know I say things on these interviews, make me sound like a complete crackpot. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> wait, what did you say? You made it sound like a, a, a crackpot. What <laughs> a crackpot, <laughs> like you're a bit nutty. Got it. Okay, okay. Uh, right. Got it. So, no, I think I do it with things like if I've heard something like you talk about, like the, the, the timbre or the tone mm -hmm. that that is translated across all of, of any sense that is perceived that to me is beautiful, uh, profound. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I understand it in the seeing of it, but I'm the being of it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the magnetism is, is, the, is the becoming and the being of that thing. And I mean, there's no way on earth I could do the things with my body that you or the people in the dance company can do. But I still can, I think I can find something akin to it. And that it's, it is about this entering a, a, a space, an endless space through movement or through song or sound. Sometimes it can be through making a mark uh, on a surface or, I mean, there's a beautiful film, La Belle Noises, and huge sections of that extraordinarily long film is just watching an artist drawing a beautiful model. Mm. And without fail, I've never been able to watch that movie in one sitting because I have to keep stopping it to go and draw. <laughs> it's a good film. Well, I'm going to take a crack at, at Bill's, <laughs> answering Bill's question. And you know, when I, when I watch, when I was, I have 11 nieces and nephews and um, they're, they're kind of out of the <clears throat> run around, play and get into trouble around the house days. Um, and I would watch them play or dance or do something in the living room or on a playground. And that sense of joy and abandonment, and, you know, uh, which is a sense of freedom is inspiring and I want to channel that. I, I, fe I feel that I get, uh, uh, you know, I get this overwhelming sense of joy that comes over me um, when I see them play or when I saw them play still today. Um, and it reminds me of being a kid, but I don't feel it immediately like in the same way they do. So I imagine that, that that's, a similar feeling to the what I what I get when I watch um, some of my favorite dancers uh, fly across stage. Um, you know, it's like this sense of just play and abandon and complete confidence in the moment. Um, and I can't do a lot of things that my favorite dancers can do. You know, but I can have the same magnetism of feeling it in the same way you're talking about it, Sandy. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if that man, sense. dance is, do you, Cisco, do you get lost in, do you have flow state stuff when you're dancing? Like, do you get lost in, is it in performing or is it in finding movement that you're going to use? And so I imagine a lot of choreography is a cerebral thing where it's like, okay, there's structure and we're breaking things down and we're recording things and we're, we're there's elements of improvisation and there's elements of construction. You know what I mean? In, mm -hmm. in choreography, mm -hmm. I'd imagine maybe more in the inspiration sort of uh, improvisation areas, but I always find when I'm working on music, say it, I, you know, I know a fair amount about music. Whenever I'm working on a music thing, because I've studied it so much, I think about music with everything I've learned. And sometimes it's hard for me to let all of that knowledge go and just enjoy it for what it was before I had all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Photography is the same yeah. way for me a lot of times. Do you find that you can let all of the, you know, 25 years of training go and get back there eventually? Or, you know, is, is all of that kind of layered on top and it's actually hard to shed it? You know what I mean? It's it's hard to think yeah, about think it on a, a primal level. I think it's uh, I think it's a practice. I don't I don't I think a lot of that stuff is um, honestly a lot of that stuff that the the training and bringing in um, these layers are are sort of uninteresting to me because I'm constantly trying to break away from my tradition. Um, while also understanding that it's just a part of my lineage is going to be a part of me, whether I try to get away from it or not. So um, I don't know that I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, I think that 
part of the craft is, you know, getting away from those structures. And yeah, yeah, difficult. Said, yeah, you, it's you, difficult. And I, I pulled the Sandy off of her. Not. I pulled Sandy off of her uh, off of her line of questioning. I apologize if you want to continue with that. That's cool. No, I'm listening to us. Uh... Okay. Yeah, it's it's I I do find it when people talk about watching dance and you know before i met all of you i didn't watch a whole lot of dance but i've seen a lot of dance in the last 15 years um i think i have a better vocabulary now than i used to have i think i have a better sense of the history of dance and where certain companies and certain performers like fit on some continuum you know what i mean in the same way that you know sandy and i often talk about visual art and we'll talk about certain painters or certain photographers and it's like okay i have a i have a general i might not know everybody on that line but i have a general sense of the shape of the line of the history of painting or the history of photography um i have less of that with the history of dance but do you think that that helps to enjoy dance or or is dance so fundamental because of human, you know, all the things we've been talking about, how every human is in a body of some kind and they move in a certain way. That that mm -hmm. that dance is special in that way, where it's it's less, it, it matters less, you know, what we know. I, you know, no, I, think, I think just yeah, I, I I think just like anything, the more you understand it, it its origins and its history, the more you you'll enjoy it. I, you know, I have, um, you know, I, I have a, um, a family member who just like, I he always, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, that's, that's fine. You know, I, but yeah, I don't think dance has this like advantage over other forms, if that's what you're implying. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it has an advantage over other farms because, frankly, I, I just, you know, either people just aren't connected to it in, in the same way. They don't have um, any association with it. I think, you know, the fact that we don't have dance in public schools, like, did you know Utah, the state of Utah requires dance every, in every public school they have, they require a dance class. Really? Yeah, why aren't we doing that everywhere? Um, I'll tell you in in the northeast, you know, what we did in school it was square dancing. Yeah, yeah, we did in, that in Texas. Physical phys, phys ed, yeah. which was actually a Henry Ford thing. It was like a weird like white supremacy thing uh mm. that that ended up getting in schools, but like I remember yeah, dosy doing and whatever it is and it was just like but it was something most people didn't want to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least yeah. in my schools. Um, yeah. But you didn't we find did dance until you were. Dancing. We used to do loads of dancing at school. We did lots of Scottish right. country dancing yeah. uh, as part of our PE classes. Yeah, um, was, was that was that a, a a heritage thing too for Scotland? Like, was that a big yeah. part of that? Yeah. Yeah. So I know that um, like uh, my daughter's dad, when we were still together, if we would go back to my home for a wedding or something. He would find it really bizarre, like all these otherwise seemingly totally normal humans. Someone would start up some particular tune or a really traditional sound, and like robots, we would just all be up and out and whicking each other around on the dance floor because we all know the gay Gordons and the Eats Them Real. And so you know, like a, we've been trained since we were kids, really. And yeah, yeah he found it really weird as a Southern English person originally from South Africa, that all these Scots just could, without even knowing it, without even remembering it. Yeah. That there's like this Scottish dance vernacular that everyone knows. <laughs> we just don't know it. <laughs> Do it. I love that. Yeah, I, mean, I was in, go ahead, Bill. No, I was I was going to ask Cisco if the same was true in Texas. Is there even a, is there a big Mexican dance tradition in 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 Texas, yeah. or is that not a thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in San I I was born in San Antonio. There's um you know there's more cumbia and 
merengue and some salsa is a little popular there but um yeah and that's actually uh, i find i found in where i grew up that it's that's pretty basic and like austin it's country dancing everybody can can country dance everybody can texas two-step it's kind of beautiful actually to see you know all of those i think i think it's because i'm from new england and we're all like puritanical like dancing is the devil kind of stuff right i think that's <laughs> probably what it is that's that's what it is you're definitely the devil i well, you know you never know uh <laughs> but... <laughs> maybe i don't know you remember footloose was was filmed in uh was took place in texas in beaumont texas and dancing oh was, really you know, i thought i always thought that was like midwestern but okay yeah that makes sense. yeah that was that was beaumont texas yeah that so, was, so uh, weird yeah it's I was going to say I was in. Sorry, Sandy. What? On this, I'm very conscious that we we're going to run out of time because I know you have another appointment because you're such you know a busy person. Um, yeah. On the screen okay. now, I just want to mention that you also have you know much as we saw one of your photographs of Paul Taylor, we also now have what I think of as a very kind of um, well, it's a very beautiful classic photograph, really. Oh, thanks yeah um, i like this one the print it's funny that you chose it's, it's funny that you chose this one because this is michael novak who was a dancer in the company at, in 2015 and in 2018 paul named him as his successor so now he's the director the artistic director of the paul taylor dance company so i think interesting that you picked that one uh, i think this one is just so beautiful Thank you. Go, was the was the top of the piano that white, or did you do stuff in post to to blend it out? Um, for the most part, it was this was in camera. I, I just brought up some whites to, um, you know, make the the bottom half of where the piano sort of slopes slopes up less gray. Did but did you really... know, did you just see this one day? Were you just like in rehearsal and you looked over the piano and you saw somebody moving and you said, "Oh, that reflection is interesting." Actually. Um, Michael Trusnevek uh, took a photograph, a few photographs of, with the reflection of the piano on his phone, and he, I think he posted them on Instagram or something. And so I, I kind of snuck over to the piano at one time with my uh, SLR and uh, was like, "What? What? That's all about? What, what can I get out of this?" And then, and then I just asked the dancers after rehearsal. You know, they would just improvise in front of the piano. So I took I took yeah. photographs of every dancer in the company um, of this. And these are these are great. These were exhibited at. Um, uh, one of the there was an event there was a dance on camera festival i think actually it was 2015 i believe dance on camera festival at lincoln center so these were these were hung up in the Furman gallery yeah yeah i mean you've had lots of work yeah. on publications and um I, I wonder about that for you as a as a dancer then photographing other dancers in the same similar way to the the way i think about you being a choreographer as much as you are a dancer is that when you photograph other dancers, do you itch to put the camera down and just go dance? Mm. No, no, actually, I, I, there's a different, um, there's a different investment um, when you're looking through the viewfinder. You have, it's just you and that that moment, the energy that's going on in, uh, in your viewfinder, and you're trying to capture. Yeah, I, I enjoy it because that that practice actually, um, I don't know how to. Don't ask me to explain it. I don't know how it works, but th that investment and that that practice of shooting dancers um, uh, and responding to it in that way uh, has actually, I think, given me a richer experience when I'm actually dancing. Mm. Has that changed yeah. over time too? As you get older, do you find that you don't need to dance as much because you, you know what I mean? Like that you, mm -hmm. you know what it is you would feel if you did it, you know, that it's, it's less about the physicality for you. It's more about what's in your head. So there's less of a need yeah. to actually just like put everything down and get up on the floor. I don't know. Is that, is yeah, that, is I mean, dance a young people's game, you know? No, absolutely not. But but it is a game for me right now. It's a game of acceptance of what my body is capable of doing now. I think yeah. there, there's a I, I struggle with the frustration to want to be able to do the things that I used to do when I was dancing full time to be able to, you know, jump as high and, you know, 
dances long um, and not feel as much pain. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working through, I think it's going to be a, the rest of my life. I might have to work through sort of where my limitations are and finding magic in those moments, which I can still find. One of the best things about being a choreographer now for me is that I can create movement that um, doesn't hurt my body <laughs> and where I'm not up all night in pain, um, you know, because I'm, I'm creating movement for myself that I know isn't going to harm me, and affect my body. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that angle. Yeah. What 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 else what what other slides do we have, Sandy? I forget. What do we get? What do we get? We're going to circle back to Pina. Um, yeah. This is from the most recent uh, Sadler's Wells production of uh, the Rite of Spring. Mm, it's finished now, and also, you, unfortunately, you can't watch it. It expired. the 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 watch back expired on like the eleventh of July. Um. If anyone's seen the Wim Wenders uh, documentary about Pina, that, that's a really interesting thing anyway, just in itself. She died very suddenly when he was in the planning stages of, of that documentary and he scrapped it. And it was the dancers themselves from the, from the company from Tanztheater Wuppertal, or Wuppertal in Germany that said, no, we must make this in her, you know, in her honor. Um, It's a great film. It is a great film. film. It, it's uh, also, you know, this idea about engagement, participating as a viewer, you know, the participation element of an audience with dance, where we are in our seats. Um, this is really visceral. Um, for people who don't know this at all, is um, you know, the ground is covered in, in peat and the right of spring is the Igor Stravinsky music. Um, which is, uh, well, at the time, at the start of the 20th century, even that piece of music was controversial. Um, and the original choreography to that piece of music was like one of the things that was supposedly, oh, terrifying people running out of theater music, and stuff like yeah, that. I mean, people, yeah. people were throwing broken glass onto the stage. Yeah, I think it was apocryphal, or was that just trumping up uh, press? I don't know. No, I think I think that anytime something moves uh, dangerously close again to this idea of there being like a true a true language, a true sort of source of something, we find it terrifying. Especially, I would say, um, arguably in northern hemisphere Western cultures, where we have so thoroughly tried to eradicate anything that's ancient or pure or, um, you know, do we you didn't- Do you think there's anything that could still ourselves. scare us that way though? Pardon? Do you, think there's anything, do you think that there's anything that could still scare us that way? Is there any dance that would still make people like throw stuff at the screen? Yeah, I mean, have you seen, um, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at um, even some of the Ido Portal and the way that um, he moves, which takes loads of references. I mean, he started out as a capoeira, um, practitioner and now has built up this empire of like movement culture the huge crossover by the way between dance movement and wellness is 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 it's obvious in one way but it's also quite uh bizarre in another way that you know a whole uh, wellness industry has sprung up around something that is so obviously inherent in each of us yet of course that should be the case because we're so disconnected from our bodies we're so disconnected from our kind of um true physical nature um i look at bodies all the time that are hunched and are contorted by modern life right so to think that people are liberated through their body is beautiful um <clears throat> Anyway, this is the Rite of Spring. And of course that's based on kind of like the pagan uh, mythologies that come up about stating the, the spring gods with a, a beautiful young woman who is sacrificed um, and through dance, uh, dances herself to death for the gods, to appease the gods. 
and that's so loaded. So that, so that the community can survive. Yeah, so, so I mean, loaded culturally differently depending on when we approach that. Um, but I mean, I think this was first performed in the 70s, I think. Oh, was it that well, those women's shoulder muscles are so beautiful. Look how, like, ugh, the shape of everything. So <laughs> nice. So. I, I mean, I, we're going to look at Martha Graham is on the last slide, but, you know, I just think even things like, uh, you know, there's something so obviously peanut bausch about um, the slip dresses and the, uh, you know, every, everything mm -hmm. that seems so... Um, inconsequential in one way is actually so careful so thoughtful mm -hmm. oh for sure and raw and, and to uh, i'm going to use the word elevate from the standard stereotype of the pretty vacant vapid though troubled mysterious perhaps ballerina uh into these kind of earthy quasi goddess yet powerfully human female or just human forms I think is just amazing love it mm -hmm. 1975 I gotta find that. you're right sorry say that again I said 1975 you're right 1970s it was, it was made in 1975 yeah that's the year yeah. I was born good year Good year for us all. <laughs> I was not. It was two years before Star Wars opened. Anyway, I think that uh, <laughs> that what I love about this work is uh, there's there's a there's a billion things I love, but one of my favorite uh, uh, elements of this is the um, the peat, the soil, mm -hmm. the, the the feet. You know, if you uh, I was doing a stereotonic. Uh, finishing up some apprentice review and um, the trainer who was, who was working with us talks about how you, you know, when you go outside, you take your shoes off, you take your, you know, you take your shoes off and you're barefoot and you step onto the dirt and you place your hands into the dirt. There's something, you know, something really grounding about it. You can feel it in your body. And um, I imagine that there's a similar response. You know, if I was up on that stage dancing with, into the dirt, how, that would change also. I mean, this is just an incredible image, first of all. Uh, but taking off the act of taking the shoes off and allowing your feet to be to absorb the earth is a it's a it's a big act. It's, a, yeah. it's so it's elemental, isn't it? And again, this challenges yeah. the sense of Bill. You asked the question like, "What's going to shock us now?" Well, isn't it sad that the thing that's actually really shocking for us is nature? Sure. Yeah. Isn't that weird to anyone else? Like that is shocking to us that we might be dirtied uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, and that there is, a, a, you know, how hard do we try to distance ourselves from the earth? And she's doing this. For many people, I five, you know, I, I I, I don't oh, think that yeah. it's because I, I think it's probably it's also a primal thing of nature and the wild is dangerous. And so we try to insulate ourselves from it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's as much we're running towards modernity. I think we're running away from fear of death by enveloping ourselves in clothes and in constructions and houses and whatever, you know, all these mm -hmm. all these things that we've created as human civilization are just ways to separate us from our animal reality, you know, because ultimately there's danger there. I think it's probably well, that was the, what it is. Yeah. I mean, that was the, that was what was so radical about the first modern dance pioneers, especially uh, uh, Isidore Duncan. You know, they, they took their shoes off and Martha Graham, they took their shoes off. That in itself was a radical act to take your shoes off and dance, you know, in the late, what 19th century to dance in nature to god forbid baroque music you know and then we have and then we have this genius martha graham this yeah, photograph that, is by barbara morgan who was a, an incredible dance photographer for 20 years this was taken in I, 1940 
I'm done. Right before sorry. World War Two. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's the, the delay. Um, he does this I was just all the time. He's always doing this to me. You can really see it when he does it to somebody else now. There go. <laughs> I'm going to play the myself over and over and see exactly. Cisco, you are only feeling what I feel every single episode. It's just the delay. What I was going to say was that it, it's always interesting to me that all of these people in the mid 20th century, how revolutionary their dance was. But now when you watch Taylor dancing to some Bach piece, it looks, it looks very structured. It looks very balletic. It looks very, I don't mean stayed in a bad way, but it seems conservative. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And to think that it, uh, there was a time when that was on the fringe of what was like socially acceptable or artistically acceptable. It's just, it's just really interesting looking at it and thinking, how are people scared of that? So in the same way that's like, how are people scared of the Beatles? You know, you listen to it now and you're like, really? What, you know, but of course there are people who were because it was just different and change. But ultimately this stuff gets accepted, whether it's abstract expressionism or it's, you know, uh, uh, I don't know who the equivalent would be in the photography world, but you know, people who, who are breaking the rules, eventually they become the rule makers and it's all just this evolution of human thought in different domains. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think every artist is in a place to defy the status quo. And once they do, then at some point they become the status quo and you know, the challenges, I think. Is that their, the is that their job to, to, to def defy the status quo? Um, I, I mean, in, in my own practice, it's it's my job to defy my own status quo, not necessarily what Paul was doing, but to you know, yeah. cons cons consistently challenge myself. I took a contemporary dance class today, uh, this morning. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of floor work, <laughs> a lot of weird coordination that, you know, was just like really bizarre and out there. I had fun. I had a good time. I, you know, I picked it up eventually. But, um, but that's outside of my comfort zone, you know. I, yeah. I don't know a lot of, I didn't see a lot of people my age or, you know, in my uh, particular genre of modern dance, you know, in that class <laughs> today. Um, not to say that they don't, but I was there, you know, and it was very strange. So that, that's, that act is, um, I think it has to. Cisco, what do you think of like the modern, uh, I don't know, scrap the word modern, the very current, trend for movement wellness so um what do i think you about? know thinking about the people i mentioned already like um Lido portal for example you know it kind of bringing out things that it in some ways is supposed to take us back by going forward through movement uh, there's there's so much that you know pops up on my Instagram feed, for example, um, people who are really acrobats actually, uh, moving in a way that is persuasively beautiful, but is uh, back to this idea of like accessibility for the body is probably going to be inaccessible for most bodies unless they train for, you know, their life. Mm -hmm. And what do, what do you think of that as a, as a dancer, thinking about these, these others who are burgeoning forth with what is like a new wave, actually, of what might become actually a dance movement culture? Is that, is it they're going in the right direction, dance? Uh, I, 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 I don't want to be so bold to say something's going in the right direction or not, but I, I think it's. Uh, well, you can only I say think, from point of view, can't you? I mean, I, I, my point of view is that the more variety and diversity it, there is, the, the better. You know, I, I think there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be the artists who are doing things for, let me get myself into trouble here, for um, their audience strictly mm. and for likes, if, if you will. Um, 
and that's that, that's a temptation but um i mean i, I truly be- believe and feel in in my heart of hearts that uh the, the more diversity there is the better and, and if people are really investing in um responding to the world and um and articulating that response in their own movement language, then um, I think that's just good for everyone. Does it irk you in the same way that I think it irks a lot of visual artists, that people who are not trained dancers are maybe packaging themselves as movement specialists? Or do you see that almost like as a separate thing? Uh, Well, I, I don't see a lot of what you're seeing. So, uh, but if, if and I'm trying to think of examples, but I, I don't see, my, my biggest concern is just the health of people's bodies. If someone's passing themselves off as a movement professional and they're, you know, um, getting clients or teaching classes and it's dangerous for, you know, they're asking people to do things that could be dangerous to their bodies um, or harmful in some way, then that does irk me. That's a problem. But if they're coming from a place where, Maybe they're not a movement professional, but they've been investing in studying uh, their own movement and being cognizant of uh, the how they work um, with a healthy body. Then what's wrong with that? I, I don't. You know, people should should be moving. I think everyone should be dancing every day. Dance every day. Dance every day. Look, just like that. And he dances all the time. You can tell. Yeah, we should all dance. We should, have a dance. we should have a dance party at the end of this, Sandy. Kick <laughs> us off. Phil, <laughs> drop drop some beats, man. I'm I'll, not, I'll pull I'm something up on my thing. I'm not convinced by any of this. You're not convinced? Cisco, it's time. Cisco we'll it's really, um, really, really interesting speaking to you about dance. And again, there's lots of things that have come up when we've been speaking that I would like to ask you more about, I think. Um, I mean, I haven't even asked you really about uh, your thesis. I love the idea <laughs> of like a returning or recurring thematic movement response to resurrection. Uh, you know, yeah, I could, yeah. another I could go on and on about that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, well, Sandy. What can I say? Thank you, Bill Wadman. Thanks, Thank Bill. You, Thanks, Thank Cisco. You, Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.